So the importance of advocating uh, in rheumatology and how it benefits uh, your practice and your patients. So why is advocacy important to physicians? And um, we see that state legislatures, especially now, are considering an increasing amount of legislation uh, with impact to our community. In response, we must be engaged because, I, I don't know if anyone said it yet, if you um, don't sit at the table, you get eaten at the table. So um, at both the state and federal levels to protect our patients and their livelihood. To help empower physician advocates, the CSRO provides resources to proactively increase patient access to rheumatologic care and medicine and to improve the practice environment for those in private practice. Personally, I've uh, advocated at the state level. I've spoken in front of the uh, Texas uh, Special Legislature about biosimilars. Um, uh, it was very interesting. I was the only one in private practice who was there. Uh, mostly pharmacy boards and pharma. Uh, I also have testified um, about biosimilars at the uh, FDA twice, in fact, and I've uh, lobbied innumerable times on the uh, Hill. So, um, if you serve as an advocate for your practice, um, you can vary the level of uh, your participation. So it could be as simple as signing a letter, of support that the uh, CSRO periodically uh, uh, sends out, or you can be more in depth and provide expert testimony at a committee hearing. And you'll be given information to review so that you will be ready for the kinds of questions they ask. No matter the level, it's your, particip your participation which will shape health healthcare policy for the future of medicine. So, you are not the only one running your practice. And I, I think I recall a, a lecture I attended where they said, we always think it's you and the patient in the room when the door is closed, but there's kind of a creepy uh, third person in the uh, room, that big brother government looking over your back. So the government impacts the way you practice, and uh, you can impact the government. So not just after laws, uh, have been affected, but actually before the legislation, that's where you, the input is the most effective. And this requires a sustained, organized commitment through a coalition of advocacy, and collectively we must all try to uh, track what's going on in your state and at the federal level and offer our own input before legislation becomes enacted. So, the quality of the advocacy to, uh, to bring uh, beneficial change. So. Quality advocacy uh, involves being consistent in the message, coordinating through various groups, and this allows you to influence the legislative and the regulative process. And there are di very many different levels that you can advocate. So, um, so as I mentioned, uh, there's not only federal, state, but even at your local level. I'm not gonna read through all those uh, parts there, but you can see where um, you can kind of pick your uh, area that you want to concentrate on. And physicians, I have always found when I've uh, gone on the Hill, we're given, a, uh, even though we sometimes don't think we're given a lot of respect, actually when we go to visit senators and representatives' offices, rarely do we get to, I've never met a senator, I've met a couple of House of Reps, but we usually talk to legislative aides who are like about the, the age of my college kids are just out of law school, but they really influence policy. So advocating is one. Our main objective is to correlate with government staffs and advocacy groups to provide nationwide rheumatologists with various types of advocacy work at all levels. So this includes member levels and testimonials to government officials, that, that's very imperative, meeting uh, meetings that build legislative awareness can also build our coalition and its effectiveness and tracking model languages, potential effectiveness within each state's legislature. The good news is, is the time commitment does not have to be inordinate for you to be an effective advocate. You can easily p participate through the options listed below. So, as I mentioned, simple advocacy, attending an advocacy day, 
um, calling or emailing your elected official, but after talking to hundreds of different representative and Senate offices, I don't know if blast emails are all that effective. Writing an op-ed for the paper, and that, I've done that and even for some online uh, uh, digital uh, papers. Send or sign a letter of support, signing a petition, and encouraging your colleagues. So uh, here's uh, uh, what the offices look like at the House of Representatives. And you want to build relationships with elected officials. I've actually had um, uh, Henry B, uh, not Henry B, his son, uh, uh, Charlie Gonzalez, actually came to my office about, I guess, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, we had contacted his legislative aide, and he had no idea what an infusion was. So he actually sat in and talked to several of my patients who grew up in a similar <clears throat> area, excuse me, of a town in San Antonio, and that's the kind of thing he remembers when he goes back onto the hill. You want to meet with your legislator locally. Um, if your legislator is supportive, be sure to thank them. Communicate with your uh, legislator often. They're going to remember your name after a period of time. Attend their local events, which they'll probably be asking for money. And participate on advisory committees. And volunteer for campaigns and attend fundraisers. So. Here are a couple of, uh, the next couple of slides are just about some of the issues that are really hot uh, and have been for the last uh, couple of years. So first step therapy, which I think uh, you'll see more as you go into practice, you might be a little bit protected in your uh, academic and uh, training area. Legislation affecting the, the patient-physician relationship is always circulating at the state and federal level. Uh, it's important to have vigilance and cooperation to, uh, when it comes to legislative regulating. And the step therapy means ensure policies that can be designed to control their own costs, and that should be uh, capitalized, by making a patient fail first on also another capitalization, cheaper medications before giving them access to the medication that you're prescribing. So physician prescribes treatment. Uh, the insurer requires the fail first and there's a possible medication advance. And um, as we all know, biosimilars are uh, really uh, coming down the pike, and uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of this for the next several years. I heard from someone last night that there are, one company has something like 14 biosimilars in the pipeline. So substitution of interchangeable biologics in a way that allows doctors to be notified in order to prevent a substitution when medically necessary and only authorize the substitution of FDA-designated interchangeable biologics. Providing access to affordable biologic products and medications is very important, and because of the complexity of these medications, uh, of course, the patient safety must come first. So what about non-medical switching? Um, state legislation uh, to require health plans to allow patients to maintain uh, medication without being required to switch based on non-medical or other financial reasons. Switching a patient's uh, medication for non-medical reasons can lead to deteriorating health and increased cost as a result to the medical care system. Decisions about a patient's treatment should be based on the patient's history, their current response to treatment, and medical judgment of the physician. And many patients with chronic conditions have been through years of painful trial and error with their physicians to find a therapy that works for them, and their health should, be, uh, should not be jeopardized for the financial gain of health insurers. And I'm feeling this on a personal level because I have a child who has uh, ulcerative colitis and is doing... Uh, in college doing very well on Umera, and I'd be concerned um, if they forced the switch. So um, the issues, PBMs. Everyone know what a PBM is? You will know soon. Uh, this is a highly consolidated uh, physician benefit managers uh, with just three PBMs that are now dominating 70% of the American market the pharmaceutical companies know they will not be able to access millions of patients unless they accommodate the demands of the P PBM. And they have dis dis 
proportionate negotiating power because the PBMs are actually coercing uh, pharmaceutical companies into offering substantial discounts and rebates, read bribes. Nothing inherently wrong with this hardball strategy. The problem is the PBMs uh, pocket these uh, kickbacks for profit. What are the conflicts of interest? Many PBMs have their own mail order and specialty pharmacies. For example, ESI's specialty pharmacy at Credo Health. And there seems to be a conflict of interest when the PBM owns the pharmacies that they are also reimbursing. So in other words, the PBM helps manage the drugs on their formulary and then negotiates prices for the drugs that it could be buying from itself. And this lack of transparency. And I think if you asked 98% of the uh, uh, physicians in this country who are actually prescribing uh, drugs which are impacted this, they could not explain it. Because I've heard the lectures probably tw 20 or 30 times and it took a while before I even understood it. So remember that the, the future of your rheumatologic practice can be shaped through advocacy. The future of our specialty can be uh, sh shaped through advocacy. If we're not at the negotiating table, we leave ourselves and our patients open to unwanted change. And as physicians, we have important relationships with local patients that, ch that choose our governmental uh, legislators, making our real world input vital to proficient to proficient legislators. So, any questions? Okay, thank you very much. No, just kidding. <laughs>